Jonathan Hooks, the executive director of the NAACP, uh, John Jacobs, president and CEO of the National Urban League. They also control the labor unions. Uh, again, people just send me information, and I, and I have a list of every member of the CIA in one particular year. I believe it was 1986. And on that list is a fellow named George Meany. George Meany is, was not a member of one of the three secret groups, but it was a member of the CIA. It was president of AFL-CIO from 1955 to 79. The fellow took his place, Lane Kirkland, uh, became president of the AFL-CIO from 79 to 95. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and Trilateral Commission. And his secretary of treasury all during his term of office was Tom Donahue, who was also a member of the same groups. Uh, you have uh, Leonard Woodcock, uh, president of the United Auto Workers Union. Now, if you wonder why they're dumbing down our kids, the uh, Albert uh, Shanker, is, is a member of the Trilateral Commission, president of the American Federation of Teachers Unions. Now, if you go to a clothing store and look at the labels of all the clothes on the rack, probably 90% of them are made in China. The rest of them are made in Central America or South America or uh, Ceylon or some very low income country. And you'd wonder why they unions allowed all these jobs to leave this country. And here's maybe the reason. Jay Mazur is president of the United uh, Union of Needleworkers Trade Industrial and Textile Employees. He's president and also Jack Shankman is president of the Malcolmated Clothing and Textile Workers Union. Now I would think that their job is to protect American jobs. Apparently, they didn't do a very good job. Now, what are they striving for? They want to create a global union. Now, they started with the uh, 15 sovereign nations of Western Europe. Uh, in 1992, they amalgamated into a group called the European Economic Community. And in the year 2000, they changed that name to the European Union. And the only thing that needs to be complete is for Great Britain and one of the Scandinavian countries to adopt a single currency and then they will all be the same. They no longer require visas or passports to go from one nation to the other within the European Union. There's one central bank located in, in Frankfurt, Germany. By the coincidence, that's where the first central bank of, that we patterned after was located, that's where the Rothschilds set up their first central bank. So is it is it strange that the central bank of the European Union would be located in Frankfurt? They have one governing body, the uh, parliament of the European Union, uh, one uh, set of laws. Last year they started their own military force. When, they, when it's up to strength, then there'll be, no longer be a need for NATO. Now, the European Union is a pattern for the next areas that they will uh, adopt. And uh, the next one is called the American Union. Uh, the, uh, several years ago, they created what they call NAFTA, made up of Canada, United States, and Mexico. That will be expanded. Uh, the first nation to be included very likely will be Chile and followed shortly thereafter by uh, the other nations, Venezuela, uh, Brazil, and others. Several years ago, David Rocca founded an agency called Council of the Americas, made up of members of every nation of North, Central, and South America and the Caribbean islands. By the year 2005, they will change the name then to the American Union. Now, I'm quoting things that not off the top of my head, but directly out of a document called Global Governance, published by the United Nations. And they'll tell you all this themselves, and it's in their timeline. Uh, now, no dictator has ever been able to take over a nation without first outlawing private ownership of firearms. Now, 
I have told people uh, from time to time that, that Australia has outlawed private ownership of firearms. And, and when a lot of the people I tell it to say, oh, no, that cannot be true. You're lying because Australia was populated by hardened criminals. That was a penal colony for the United Kingdom. And so the people there, their descendants from these hardened criminals would not allow their government to take their firearms. A couple of years ago, a fellow supposedly went berserk, killed 37 people with AK-47. They quickly outlawed the private ownership of firearms, gave their citizens two years to turn in their guns, but they said they would buy the guns. And uh, I spoke at, uh, at the Nexus conference in Sydney, Australia last year, and and the publisher of Nexus Magazine is a friend of mine, and I asked him if, if how many people he thought turned in their weapons in Australia, and he said, oh, maybe a third, because we know that someday we may have to defend ourselves against our governments as well as yours. So the year 2005 is three years and just under two months away. They're going to have to really hook it up in order to make that schedule, but but these are relentless people. They will jump on anything like uh, the New York and, and the Washington catastrophes to tighten up our laws, to use the excuses to eventually register our firearms, and then take our firearms, and then send us to prison if we don't turn them in or if, we, if they find one on us and we don't have a permit. The next region is uh, called the Asian Union, it's made up of 16 sovereign nations of the Pacific Rim. In 1994, a, an organization was founded called the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation, made up of those nations. Their goal is to convert that into the Asian Union by the year 2010. Now, somewhere between 2010 and 2015, they'll move into this, the last union called the Soviet Union, and it's made up of 32 sovereign nations that, that uh, was, was then formed into the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Republics. And it's scheduled to become the Soviet Union between 2010 and 2015, but this time not under communist control, but under direct control of the elite. Now let's get into the book the Elite Serial Killers of Lincoln, JFK, RFK, and MLK. I start way back in the year 650 AD. There was a region uh, between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea and north of the Caucasus, uh, Caucasus Mountains, part of southern Russia today, called the Khazar, area of Khazar, K-H-A-Z-A-R. Their leader was called a Kagan or Kagan, K-H-A-G-A-N, and uh, they were nomads, uh, primarily from Mongolia, and made up of Huns and people from the steppes of Russia. Uh, they finally settled down, and uh, the leaders of uh, Russia at that time came to this Kagan or sent him word and said that we want you and your tribe to take up the Orthodox religion of Russia. Well, he thought, being as he was the leader, that he would use his own initiative, and he called in the leaders of all the religions that practiced in that region and asked them to give him a pitch about the advantages of being in their religion. When he got through, he settled on Judaism. Uh, he told all of his tribal members that they were now to worship uh, the Jewish religion, Judaism, all the men were circumcised, and from then on, they practiced Judaism. Now, I bring this up because uh, in a, I was on a talk show in Toronto several months ago, and I was talking about the Rothschilds and their efforts to try to control the world. And it was a call-in show, and, and a fellow called, and he said, why do you allow uh, any Semite like your guest to be on your program? And my answer was, I have not said anything anti-Semitic. I am not anti-Semitic. In fact, my private, my personal assistant 
in my business and my personal best friend is a Semitic Jew. So I would not hire that person or have that person as one of my best friends if, if I were anti-Semitic. And uh, so he hung up. <laughs> now, I bring up the, the, the Khazars were overrun by Genghis Khan and, and several other uh, marauders in those days. And, and finally they were uh, scattered out. Uh, the area of Khazar uh, was included in some of the surrounding nations. The uh, people that were Khazarian Jews at that time went into Russia and into Western Europe. And the reason I go into the Khazarian Judaism is because the Rothschilds and most of the international bankers are Khazarian Jews. They're not Semitic Jews. <coughs> uh, and the uh, Khazarian Jews are not uh, descendants of Shem. They are not members of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, they're simply a group of people and in 640 decided to become Jews. That's, that's, that's all they are. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Khazarian Judaism or Semitic Judaism or any other religion. I'm just giving some facts that, that might be interesting to you. Now the first family to be called Rothschild uh, Back in uh, 1744, there was a uh, fella that had a goldsmith shop in a building. There was a three-story building. Uh, he and his family lived on the second and third floor, and his place of business was on the first floor. It was a goldsmith shop. His name was Bayer or Bauer, and uh, his eldest son was uh, Meyer Amschel Bayer or Bauer. Uh, when he was about 15 or 16 years of age, he went to work in the opera, Oppenheimer Bank and quickly learned the art of money. And he stayed with them a couple of years and then finally went back to Frankfurt and joined his father in his business. Only he took up the, uh, his products were uh, rare coins and collectibles. And uh, so he, when a member of the royal family would come in to buy a uh, rare coin, for example, he'd say, well, being you're a member of the royal family, I'll give you a 10, 15% discount. Now, send your friends in. And, and after a while, he'd say, if, now, if you'll introduce me to your finance minister that in the, on the king's staff, then I'll, I'll give you another bonus. And then when he got in contact with the finance minister, he said, if every time the king needs money, if you'll borrow it from me, I'll give you a kickback. And also from about 1760 on, the, uh, well, let me step back. Uh, in those days, almost everyone was illiterate. And uh, so if you wanted to go up to a place of business, you, you went to a symbol over the door, beside the door. Uh, there might be a, a fish or a deer's head or a sword or a sailing ship or something like that. Over the door in front of the building owned by Bears was a simple red sign. In German that is pronounced Rothschild or Rothschild. Uh, some people say that Rothschild or Rothschild translates into red shield. That's not true. My German partner I asked that specific question and his comment was it simply means red sign. So as people would have a need for some uh, gold trinket, they would go to this building, look for the red sign, and, and as they walked in the door, they'd say, is this the house of Rothschild? Or is this the place where the red sign is where I can buy gold products? Uh, it didn't take long for the elder Bayer to drop the name Bayer and acquire the name Rothschild. So the first son to be called Rothschild was Meyer Amschel Bayer Rothschild. Uh, he had five sons and seven daughters. In those days, and, and it could be true today, but uh, when there was an inheritance, the, the daughters of the family never got anything. It always went to the sons. 
And the uh, eldest son was always in charge of the family. So uh, 